Thank you all for coming to the Early uh, Career Immunology Seminar. I'm Timo Sullivan, Assistant Professor of Immunology at UCLA. And the purpose of this seminar series is to increase the exposure of early career faculty in a time in which we haven't achieved equity and representation at scientific conferences and seminars, despite equally innovative discoveries. We're really excited to have Tim Hand here with us today from the University of Pittsburgh. Tim is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Immunology and the Director of the Nobiotic Animal Core Facility. He received his Bachelor's of Science uh, from the University of Toronto, so he's a proud Canadian, and he subsequently got his PhD from Yale University and followed up his studies in his PhD with a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, uh, working with Yasmin Belcade. Tim's current research focuses on the interaction between the host immune system and the intestinal microbiota, with a particular focus on how this relationship is shaped by diet and infection. Uh, which we're all really excited about. Um, his research has provided new knowledge on how immune cells are shaped by the microbiome and in turn, how colonizing bacteria are shaped by intestinal immunity. Tim has received many nationally competitive awards, including several innovation awards from the Rain Foundation and the March of Dimes. He's also the recipient of several NIH grants and we're all very excited to have him with us today and hear about his uh, new work uh, titled Shaping the Intestinal Immune Response with the Microbiota. So if any of you have any questions during Tim's talk, go ahead and type them into the chat. We will read them to Tim uh, later on, and he will address those questions after his talk. So with that, I'll let Tim take it away. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. It's a really, uh, it's a really great chance for me to share uh, my work on a large stage. Um, and I'm, and, you know, it's exciting that it'll be it'll be on YouTube, and so people can uh, can tune in at any time and, and really catch up with what we've been doing. Uh, it's a great way to get um, early career research out into the world. So um, I'm going to go quickly. I'm going to go try to go quickly today to go through two stories, and then I'll wait. I'll take questions on both of them at the end, just because of the format. I'm not going to stop halfway through and, and take questions. So to start off. Uh, I just wanted to give an introduction to what my lab works on. So really, uh, the entire lab is focused on the interaction between the immune system and the microbiota, um, both how the immune system is able to shape the microbiota, and then, of course, uh, what we'll actually be talking about more today, how the microbiome shapes the immune response. And, and in particular, we are interested uh, in colonization events. So these are events uh, when you get a new bacteria uh, entering into the system, uh, because we think that these are opportunities for the immune, the immune microbiome relationship to be reset. Um, and that through the, through the mechanisms of immune memory and uh, shifts in the microbiome, these can actually be translated uh, long-term through the host and contribute to multiple diseases. Uh, additionally, and um, you know, making our, our, our uh, job a little bit more difficult, you know, this immune microbiome relationship doesn't exist in a vacuum. So we also in the lab have to take into account the fact that the intestine is, is the most common site of infection in the body as well, that, the, um, that the, what the microbiome actually evolved to do, which is to help you digest your food, is actually an incredibly important uh, factor. So what we're really trying to do is integrate all four of these different things into, into one system. And now actually also trying to look at how uh, it can, how these kinds of immune memory responses can be translated, uh, you know, through the mother into the child uh, via the provision of maternal antibodies. All of this we would argue is tremendously important because as I'm sure most of you know, if you disrupt this relationship between the immune response um, and the microbiome, you, you, it can lead or contribute to multiple uh, uh, incredibly important um, gastrointestinal diseases. Okay, so if we're going to be focused on colonizing bacteria, I thought it might be important to give you a bit of an introduction as, as to how the immune system deals uh, with colonizing bacteria. And so I'm first going to start with, you know, how I guess we would have thought that this worked uh, when I first started my postdoc now almost uh, a decade ago in, in Yasmin Belkade's lab, where the idea was is that uh, that Bacteria and their antigens were largely kept on their side of the intestinal epithelium via the dual effect of the intestinal epithelium and the things that it secretes, things like mucus and antimicrobial peptides. However, uh, you know, this, this barrier is not absolute and, the, and peptides will come across. And so at the time, 
we thought that largely what would happen is that if these were from you know commensal or innocuous microbes, that these would be trafficked to the mesenteric lymph node by dendritic cells, and that in the the unique or distinct environment of the mesenteric lymph node, the these dendritic cells would drive the differentiation of regulatory T cells. Uh, in this case, we now know in our gamma T positive. Um, FOXB3 positive T regulatory cell, these T cells would, these T reg cells would interact with B cells. Uh, and in this case, you, you'd have a, a microbiome specific B cell that would lead to the differentiation of this cell to, to secrete IgA. IgA would be passed across the membrane binding to the bacteria. And then so essentially you have sort of a sterile or non-inflammatory loop formed where you can physically increase the distance or, or you know, or, or inhibit uh, colonizing bacteria from, from entering into the host. Um, of course, in the last decade, what we've learned uh, from a wide variety of researchers in this, in this field is that this really was a little bit simplified and that in fact, um, antigen or T cell immune responses uh, uh, being induced by these dendritic cells are incredibly contextual, right? So the first context is tissue. So, you know, the intestine is not just one long tube, there are differences between the kinds of immune responses that are triggered in the colon, which tend to be more regulatory cells, like what I'm showing here, and in the small intestine where these responses tend to be more uh, shifted towards TH17. Of course, the type of bacteria that's colonizing makes a big difference, as we'll see in my talk. So probably the best example of this is, is segmented filamentous bacteria, which uh, induces TH17 responses uh, versus other kinds of clostridia and bacteroides. Uh, that induce regulatory T cells. And finally, uh, something that will be very important as, as my talk goes on, um, the, the context of, of the host intestine is also incredibly important. So if there's infection or inflammation around that can shift the, immune, the, 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 the T cell immune response against the microbiome from a T regulatory or T follicular helper cell state or sort of a homeostatic state to a more effector cell state that might be contributing uh, to inflammatory disease. So with that background in mind and with that idea, what we're gonna to talk to or talk about today is two instances where the, the, the context of the host shifts a T cell immune response against the microbiome to either contribute to or protect against disease. So we're first gonna talk about how uh, immune responses against T cells uh, in, this, in this disease of malnutrition called environmental enteric dysfunction uh, can affect the efficacy of oral vaccines uh, in the small intestine. And then second, we're gonna, we're gonna shift to talk about uh, immune responses against colorectal cancer and how they can be actually activated or augmented by making rational shifts in, in the microbiome. So first let's talk about, about malnutrition. And this slide is actually sort of one of the few slides you'll see about, about an infectious or you know, public health event in the last few years that things are, things are getting substantially better. So what this is, this is a paper from Nature showing the incidence of stunting uh, worldwide, which really, it's really quite good news. So efforts of, of governments and of, of aid agencies around the world have really reduced this in many, many countries worldwide. The bad news is it's still very, very common. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly important problem because once a child uh, via malnutrition and chronic infection ends up stunted, it's incredibly uh, difficult to remedy that uh, after the fact. So when you miss that window of growth early in your life, it's really hard to get that, get that back. And in many, of, many low and middle income countries, height and IQ, which are the two things affected most by stunting, are really the best correlation to your lifelong earnings. So, so you really wanna maximize that in every children to give them the opportunity for, for lifelong success. So part and parcel to stunting is this disease uh, we're gonna talk about here. And this, is, this has been termed environmental enteric dysfunction. So this is a disease that in America and in, in Europe and other high income countries, you will never see it. I mean, the number, the incidence of cases in Pittsburgh, I'm sure it was last year was zero. However, hundreds of millions of children uh, throughout uh, low and middle income countries are at risk. Um, and the disease, so the disease associated, uh, we'll talk about the etiology in the next slide, but basically this is what the disease looks like. So essentially what happens is the, the lamina propria of the small intestine becomes invaded with immune cells and you actually get a reduction in the surface area of the small intestine. And so not only do you have inflammation in this site, but, this site, but you actually, you know, you lose absorptive power in the small intestine. So any kind of, of, of malnutrition effect or, or lack of, of uh, nutrients in the, in the diet are gonna be exacerbated by this disease, which is why it's so closely associated with, with stunting and lack or reduced brain, brain development. Uh, the key thing is, is that recent data from the Gordon lab 
and others have shown that diet alone is not sufficient to restore this disease. So there's, there's sort of a hangover effect of the immune response in this tissue, I, I would hypothesize, that's, that's making it last after even after you've restored uh, a, a healthier diet to these children. And, and the, the, the effect seems to be driven by a microbiome that's invaded by Enterobacteriaceae. And this will be, this, these are organisms like Enterobacter, uh, Serratia, uh, and of course, Escherichia coli. Um, and finally, uh, in some, some studies, they, they've, they've actually detected that there's an increase in, in cells that are consistent with T regulatory cells in this infiltration. So, uh, you know, we, there's still a lot we don't know about this disease, but this is the hypothesis uh, put forth by Bill Petrie about how this, um, how this might be happening. So I want to be clear about everything I'm going to show you here. The solution to the problem really is getting uh, sanitation, I believe, and plumbing and flush toilets to the whole world. But uh, because the real issue at the center of this is, is, is fecal contamination of the environment and chronic infection. And when, when these children get chronically infected with different kinds of enteric uh, viruses, bacteria, and parasites, this can lead to that, that sort of chronic G GI damage and inflammation that leads to the loss of surface area. And so this, in, 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 in concert with a, with a diet low in protein and fat, uh, can, will, will, will lead to the, the condition of EED uh, characterized by malabsorption, malnutrition, and stunting. So what, we, what we've been interested in, in in our lab, though, is is another aspect of this disease, which is, I think, particularly tragic, which is that the we would love to be able to go into these children and orally vaccinate them against some of the bacteria and parasites and viruses that are causing uh, this problem and that are at the core of it. However, what has been noticed by many different groups worldwide is that oral vaccines uh, and mucosal vaccines in these children work, work very poorly. And they're much less efficient in these children than in the same, than the same children um, uh, in, in, in high income countries. So uh, unfortunately for us, uh, getting samples from these children is very difficult. So we felt like a simplified mouse model would be a really great way to, to make inroads onto this question of, of oral vaccines and, and why they're failing. So this was the project of Amrita Bhattacharji when she joined my lab. And as you'll see, she's done a huge amount of work uh, to establish this model and really characterize uh, oral vaccination in it. So we, we started from a really strong base, which was there was a, when, when Amrita had joined the lab, there had just been a paper published from Brett Finley's lab describing a mouse model of EED. And, and the, their mouse model um, we felt was looked great, but it, it was a little bit complex uh, for us. And, and when you read the paper closely, uh, what was clear was that all of the things that, that the Finley lab was doing to the microbiome were really in service of allowing for a microbiome that would allow the invasion of the mucosal or the mucus space, uh, the mucus layer with E. coli. So we uh, had the hypothesis that if we just use a strain of E. coli, in this case, it'll, it'll be this strain here we're using three of our experiments called CUMT8 that uh, automatically invades the mucus or constitutively invades the mucus that we might be able to get around some of the, the shifts in the microbiome that the Finley lab was using. Uh, and so just to give you an example, this is that strain invading the, uh, the epithelium of a mouse invaded with the toxoplasma. So this is a strain that, that naturally invades the epithelium in terms of, of inflammation. And so how, this is how the model is gonna work. So we, we, again, we took advantage of a diet that had been published by the Finley lab that has, that has the same number of calories as our, as our control diet, but much less fat and protein than the, than the mice need uh, for their weekly allotment. And we're going to, in all of our experiments, use four groups. So mice that get the malnourished diet, mice that get just the bacteria, the CM28 that invades the epithelium, or mice that get both of those things. And these are what we're going to call our EED mice. And so this is a disease of children. So we use developing mice to, to, to test the disease. And so we start the, the, the protocol on three-week-old mice. We leave them in the diets for about two weeks, and then we colonize them with the CMT80 E. coli. And then about two weeks after that, we, we analyzed them for the development of EED. And so it took us about six months to, to really nail down all the components of, of this model. But when we did, we were very gratified to see that we see a disease that we would, we, we would describe as being very similar uh, to what we see, what we would think of EED as in children. So first is that the, the mice don't lose weight. This is very critical, but they gain weight much more slowly. So it's not that the mice are completely lacking development, it's that their development is, 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 is now just not sufficient. 
Additionally to weight, we also see that the, the mice uh, have much shorter tails indicating that their stature or their height would, would in fact be smaller. Perhaps more importantly, we saw, uh, we saw, we, we saw that the, the disease was actually focused on the ileum and the, and the small intestine, which is what you'd expect for children. As you can see here, we see the characteristic flattening of the villi that's care, that, that, that is found in children with EED, as well as we very commonly saw a, a, a cellular infiltrate at the, in the lamina propria. So these lamina propria almost look like swollen with immune cells, and this was very commonly seen. Additionally, I'm not gonna show you the data, but very recently we, we've noticed that a lot of the biomarkers of uh, EED in the small intestine, things like interferon gamma and lipocalin are very, very significantly upregulated in our model. And so we do think, if I can give a bit of um, an advertisement, we do think that this is a very uh, nice model for studying this disease in mice. So uh, now that we have established the EED model, I, I, I indicated earlier that what we really wanted to look at was oral vaccination. And so to do that, we took advantage of a tool that I first started playing with uh, when I was a postdoc in Yasmin Belkade's lab, which is uh, a mutant version of the E. coli heat label toxin. So the heat label toxin is the causative agent of diarrhea along with the stable toxin uh, in enterotoxigenic E. coli, which many of you might know as, as traveler's diarrhea. So this is a very sort of typical diarrhea causing toxin. It's an AB5 um, toxin, very similar to cholera uh, in that it forms a pore in the epithelial uh, surface of the epithelium of, of um, any person who's, who's, who's ingested ETAC. And then you get cleavage of the, uh, um, of the A subunit, uh, which then goes down and activates adenylate cyclase, um, leading to cyclic AMP production and um, chloride um, released by the CFTR gene leading to diarrhea. So what was done by our collaborators, John Clements and Betsy Norton down at Tulane, was to make a double mutant version of, of this toxin where the cleavage site uh, via which the host protease cleaves the A subunit and the active site uh, where that activates adenylate cyclase are both, both mutagenized. So using this double mutant label toxin, uh, the mice still, and actually this is in, in trials for humans, mice and humans still get massive T and B cell immune responses against the label toxin, but they, they, get, uh, they don't develop diarrhea so you, you, can, you can still use it as an adjuvant uh, and as a, as a vaccine, but you know, it doesn't have any of the negative side effects. So the reason we, we love this as a vaccine is because in, you know, at least in my experience, this is the most powerful oral vaccine I've, I've used. Or, um, so if you do a simple uh, prime boost separated by seven days uh, and then assess uh, the number of DMLT specific T cells with a tetramer that we make in house, as you can see, there really is a very pretty huge immune response uh, that is characterized uh, most strongly by T a mixed Th17, Th1 immune response. And you can readily pull these cells out um, uh, via magnetic uh, pull down of, of the tetramer specific cells. And, and so it allows you to do a lot of different things we won't talk about today, but because of the number of cells, you actually have enough cells to do some of the downstream uh, experiments. You might be interested to look at the longevity and functionality of of, of memory CD4 T cells in the small intestine. So this is, the, this is the new protocol we're gonna do. As I showed you before, if you use three week old mice and put them on all our various diets and then colonize them with E. coli, they develop EED. So right at the peak of their EED uh, phenotype, we're gonna immunize these mice with a prime boost. And then we're gonna look at day 42 uh, for their T cell immune response. So as you might imagine, uh, given that we've done this huge preamble to get to this point, we did see a, a pretty significant response, but we were, we were still very surprised by the size of the response. And, and basically what we're showing is that mice that have, that have frank EED, but not the mice that have that just been given the malnutrition chow or mice just given the E. coli, but mice that have, that have been given both and developed uh, the disease have a more than tenfold reduction in the accumulation of vaccine specific T cells in their small intestine. Critically, we don't see any phenotype in these same mites in the mesenteric lymph nodes. So what this in, in indicates is that the vaccine is getting taken up by dendritic cells in the small intestine, it's getting traffic to the mesenteric lymph node and it's inducing T cell immune responses, but those T cells are then are failing to accumulate or proliferate in, in significant numbers once they get to the small intestine. So uh, it became important to us at this point to, to also determine if 
um, this lack of T cells had any effect, would have, could have any effect on the ability of these mice to be protected since this isn't a vaccine, this is a vaccine model. So here what we did was we vaccinated mice, uh, as I showed you before, with a prime boost. And then at, at 14 days after the, after the prime or seven days post boost, we're then gonna challenge the mice with the human uh, isolate of enterotoxigenic E. coli H10407. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, for a mouse model, this, this uh, bacteria does not cause diarrhea in mice. There's no real phenotype in the mice. You know, there's, there can be modest um, induction of liquid into the intestine, but it really isn't frank diarrhea. Which, but what you can do with this strain is we can measure the colonization ability. And, and you know, gratifyingly, what we were able to see was that mice that had been vaccinated had a, had a very significant uh, reduction in the colonization of these bacteria in the small intestine and cecum, and that this, this vaccination uh, or colonization control uh, could be uh, largely eliminated by depleting CD4 T cells. So when we saw that, we, we you know, this result became much more obvious to us, which was that mice that have EED and have been vaccinated are unable to control uh, colonization with enterotoxigenic E. coli compared to all of the different control mice. And again, similar to what we showed with the vaccine, there was a modest phenotype in the mice that were given, that were just given the malnutrition diet. Okay, so at this point, what I think we've been able to show is that, that we have a mouse model of EED and that that mouse model basically fails to accumulate CD4 T cell responses. And in data, I didn't show you uh, significant uh, IgA responses against oral vaccine in the small intestine. So the next big thing we wanted to figure out obviously would be the mechanism of this. And as you might imagine, our model of EED had a very significant uh, difference in the intestinal microbiota. Here I'm showing you the, the, the small intestinal microbiota of mice with EED. As you can see, it shifts very significantly. Um, and uh, accordingly, when you, do, when you deplete these mice of their microbiome long-term uh, for an extended period of three weeks, we can actually restore the ability of these mice to respond to oral vaccine, uh, um, indicating that the microbiota is a critical component of uh, the uh, EED's um, of EED's inhibition of the accumulation of CD4 T cells in response to oral vaccines. So. We knew from the work of many, many different labs that the microbiota in, in the, the colon was critical uh, to the population of, in, of, um, of intestinal Tregs. And so we wanted to see whether perhaps intestinal Tregs here in the small intestine would also, could also be potentially responsible for this, this inhi inhibition we see of an oral vaccine response. Uh, and interestingly, we saw a modest but very significant uh, induction in T regulatory cells in the small intestine of mice that had EED. But really surprisingly, again, similar to what we saw with the vaccine, there was no phenotype in the same Tregs in the mesenteric lymph node. So again, this is a phenotype that's confined only uh, to the small intestine. So at this time, it was very fortuitous to us that there were a series of, of really transformative papers on the uh, on T regulatory cells in the intestines that were published by Diane Mathis and Gerardo Barrel, Charlie Sur, and Dan Littman. Uh, and if you put all these different papers together, what you could actually figure out for the, for the intestine was what different regulatory T regulatory cells in the intestine were responding to. For example, regulatory T cells expressing R gamma T uh, were pretty clearly shown to be responding to bacteria whereas those that uh, expressed neuropillin and not R gamma T were sort of the more classical thymic derived self-specific T regulatory cell. And, uh, and work from Charlie Sir, uh, those T regs in the small intestine that were, that were negative for, for both of these markers appeared to be specific to food antigens. So given this information, Amrita then looked and saw uh, what was going on. And what we saw was a, was a pretty significant increase uh, in, these, in these mice in the fraction of cells that were making R gamma T and a decrease in, in the cells making neuropillin. So putting this together into, into a graph, what we, could, what we were able to show now was that on top of the fact that there was an increase in the number, a modest increase in the number of T regulatory cells that were accumulating in the small intestine of mice with EED. Now of those Tregs, we were seeing a really much more significant fraction of them expressing our gamma T, indicating potentially 
that these were responsive uh, to the unique conformation of the microbiome or perhaps E. coli itself going together very well with our, our microbiota data and our microbiome depletion data. So given uh, all of these things being put together, uh, the next thing we did was try to say if it was then sufficient uh, or if these R gamma T expressing C regulatory cells were sufficient to drive uh, the failure of CD4 T cells in the small intestine. So we bred mice uh, where we could, uh, we could excise the RRC gene, uh, which makes R gamma T, only from T regulatory cells in, um, via the provision of tamoxifen. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to induce EED in these mice and we're gonna give tamoxifen. So this is, this is actually untrue. We were giving tamoxifen throughout the, the, the process. So we never form these uh, RR gamma T expressing T regulatory cells. Um, and so we're gonna give tamoxifen all the way through. So we'd never form RR gamma T T regs. And when we did that, what we were able to show was that we could completely restore uh, the accumulation of vaccine specific CD4 T cells in the small intestine. Again, the same cells in the mesenteric lymph node were unaffected. And gratifyingly, what we were able to do as well was restore at least somewhat the protection against ETEC colonization. So here, what we've, we've been able to restore is not just the, the accumulation of CD4 T cells, but the ability of these mice to protect themselves against a rechallenge uh, with enterotoxigenic E. coli. Uh, however, one of the things, this, and this was great, and it sort of was a great way to complete the loop on this project, uh, but you know, every, every good thing has a consequence. And so although these mice were, these mice that where we depleted our gamma T T regs had substantially improved oral vaccine responses, uh, one thing that Amrita noted right away was that they also had very significant stunting. So, I mean, you can see here on the graph that the, these mice basically stopped growing from, um, from the moment that we initiated EED by colonizing them with CUMT E. coli. But as well, I think it's much more uh, dramatically shown here on the right. This is an EED mouse. So this is a mouse that is already small compared to a, a healthy, you know, uh, ISO diet fed control mouse. Uh, whereas you can see this mouse is most, is, you know, is very, very, you know, is quite emaciated and quite tiny uh, in stature. And so, um, you know, we think that although these R gamma T T regs uh, are preventing the oral vaccine response. They probably do have a function in the sense that they're probably, uh, you know, um, I should go to the, the model slide. What these R gamma T T regs are probably also doing is supporting the proper function of the small intestine. So putting this all together, our model is that in data I didn't show you that that low protein and low fat diet is necessary to shift the microbiome and allow. Uh, the invasion of the mucus layer by these adherent invasive E. coli. Uh, but then the sort of evolutionary immune response of our ancestors, which probably had to deal with a lot of these, uh, these adherent E. coli, is to induce our gamma T regs. And a side effect that is, is what I showed you is where these cells, you know, prevent local T cell immune responses in this tissue, either by, you know, by affecting trafficking of the cells or proliferation once they get to the tissue but that these cells probably what they evolved to do is to shut down the local immune response in the intestine when you have an inflammatory microbiome or an inflammatory organism around while allowing the systemic immune response to may, remain intact, right? So remember the, 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 the T cell responses we saw in the lymph nodes of these mice were completely normal. So their systemic response against an escape of one of these organisms into, uh, into the, the bloodstream or the lymph is still is still intact, and these mice are still vigilant against that kind of thing. What they what they're preventing is sort of a lethal inflammatory uh, sequela in their small intestine specifically. So you know we would say as evidence of this model, you know IBD by many different groups worldwide has been linked to these kinds of inherent adherent bacteria, um, and we would predict in in work moving forward um, that the symptoms of of our EED protocol. Uh, would be much more severe on, on mice that, that are IBD prone. And we're, we're looking at that and, and other aspects of this model, including the, you know, a more chronic model that might be more indicative of, of the course of human disease uh, moving forward. So um, at this point, I'd like to switch a little bit, switch over to the, the second part of the talk, where we're going to discuss a different aspect by which um, 
uh, mucos, mucus resident or epithelial adherent bacteria can augment the immune response. In this case, shifting the, the, the anti-tumor immune response in, in colorectal cancer. So um, probably don't need to give this introduction, but you know I'm going to anyways. Um, so as you, as many of you know, colorectal cancer is is still an incredibly huge problem. Uh, and what's been most scary about this disease is, despite the fact that colorectal cancer continues uh, to decline in in older populations, it's actually on the rise in young people worldwide. Uh, and something that's probably been most brought to the public's attention by the tragic uh, recent passing of Chadwick. Um, Bozeman. So the reason for this increase in colorectal cancer is not well understood, uh, but you know the low-hanging fruit of um, of why this might be increasing in young populations is obviously diet, uh, which has shifted very significantly in high-income countries and by extension uh, the 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 microbiome. Oh, of course. So uh, as many of you know, colorectal cancer has, has been associated very closely with the intestinal microbiome. Uh, beautiful work uh, by a number of groups have shown that the microbiome can directly activate the, the uh, can directly activate um, oncogenesis in, in epithelial cells. And as well, what we're, what we're gonna be more interested in today is that the, the, um, the microbiome can, can uh, mediate immune mediated effects. And, and what we're showing on this graph what they're really talking about is, is uh, the microbiome driving inflammation, which can increase colorectal cancer um, susceptibility. But what we're gonna be talking about today is ways that perhaps the microbiome might be used to, to augment anti-tumor immunity. So given that the, 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 the intestinal microbiome or the colonic microbiome can both um, drive uh, formation of tumors, but also in some instances, uh, in particular, what's recently been shown for melanoma, uh, lead to uh, the augmentation or the or support anti-tumor immunity. Uh, the hypothesis of Abio Bericker Delgoff, another postdoctoral fellow in the lab, was be if, if we if we know this information and we know which bugs do what, we should be able to rationally modify the microbiome and suppress or augment uh, tumor immunotherapy. So the bug that, that Abby chose to do this work uh, is Helicobacter hepaticus. And I'm gonna go through a few slides of background about why this was, we think this was a good choice. And I hope with you by the, I hope by the end of the talk, you'll agree with us. So Helicobacter hepaticus is a, is a, is a, is a gram negative uh, proteobacteria that's commonly found in the cecum and colon of laboratory mice. And in particular, I should point out that this is not a uh, artifact of, of laboratory mouse colonies and that these kinds of helicobacters are very commonly found uh, in wild mouse colonies as is evident from the work of Barbara Rariman. So one of the reasons why I pushed Abby to work on, on this particular bug and not other bugs was around the time we were making this decision, uh, uh, Dan Lippman and uh, Chae Sung Shea had published beautiful work uh, and had, had, had put tools into the Jackson Labs by which we could follow the T-cell immune response to Helicobacter very closely. So what I'm showing you here is work that was done uh, in the Littman lab where they, they adoptively transferred Helicobacter specific T-cell receptor transgenic T-cells into a mouse and then gavaged that mouse with Helicobacter to colonize it. If you just wait 10 days, uh, the Littman lab was able to show that there was a very significant um, induction of, of T-regulatory cell differentiation and T-flickler helper cell differentiation amongst the helicobacter specific T cells. So these are, these are, this is a bug that's able to spontaneously induce T cell responses in the colon. As well, we thought it was, it would be a useful choice because of work that had been done decades before uh, those sort of seminal Che and, and Lippmann papers in the laboratory of Alan Scher, Marika Kulberg and, and Fiona Powery, which showed that in, in mice that are uh, you know, prone to inflammation, in this case, IL-10 knockout mice or mice that are treated with a blocking antibody towards IL-10, that you know, regulatory T-cell differentiation or follicular helper T-cell differentiation that happens in steady state now shifts to an inflammatory Th1 and Th17 uh, T-cell response. And indeed, uh, these cells, these helicobacter cells alone can be transferred into, um, uh, into uh, lymphopenic mice and are, are sufficient to induce colitis uh, on that transfer. Finally, um, James Fox for years has shown that in mice that, uh, in this case, these are RAG2 knockout mice that have no T and B cells, 
the simple colonization of, 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 my, of these mice that have no, no T cells is sufficient to induce massive inflammation uh, driven by ILCs in the cecum and colon that actually eventually leads, as you can see here, to colorectal cancer. Um, so, you know, putting these all these things together, the take home message for, for everyone who's trying to sort of get a, get a hold of this as we go forward is that basic mice that don't have T cells and don't, and particularly don't have T regulatory cells will get cecal and colon cancer and colitis. But if you have T regs and T regs are intact, T regs are sufficient to block the colitis and therefore sufficient to block the cancer development in the system. So putting all these things together, this is why I thought Helicobacter would sort of be the perfect sort of rational model uh, to test the effect of the microbiome on, on colorectal cancer because, you know, with this system, we could take in or add in T regulatory cells um, and be able to manipulate this in a very, very careful way. As you will see, you know, as, as happens to so many of us, the, act, the actual experimental system itself um, went in a totally different direction from that. And we weren't actually able to, ever, able to use any of those tools to, to study this, but I, I hope you'll agree that we think we came to a very interesting uh, story nonetheless. So the other big advantage of Helicobacter as a model is that we could get a very cheap source of, of mice uh, where we could add in Helicobacter or leave it out very easily. And these are, these are C57 black six mice uh, from Jackson's, Jackson Labs. So Jackson routinely tests their mice to be helicobacter free so we can buy mice uh, from this source. Uh, and then what, we, what we'll do is we'll give them an IP injection with methane. This is the carcinogen that's gonna uh, make the initial hit that's gonna induce the colorectal cancer. And in order to get uh, the colorectal cancer to go a bit faster because we can't you know, wait nine months to a year uh, for these mice to develop uh, tumors, if, if Abby's going to ever, um, you know, finish up in my lab, we're going to give the mice DSS to induce inflammation and sort of supercharge the tumors three times. So a critical thing about this project is that Abby was not interested uh, in particularly preventing tumors. She wanted a, she wanted something that would affect tumors that had already been formed or something that was therapeutic. So we are gonna wait until after the second dose of DSS and I'm not gonna show you the data, but we can already see very visible adenocarcinomas, uh, sorry, adenomas at this, at this time point um, after the second uh, dose of DSS. And then we're gonna give, we're gonna colonize the mice with helicobacter after that. So I say our hypothesis, is, hypothesis, but I think it was really just my hypothesis and Abby went along. I think she had other much smarter ideas, but my hypothesis was that giving them helicobacter after the second dose of DSS would either increase inflammation or it would induce Tregs, but either way, uh, helicobacter colonization would increase tumor burden and you're essentially gonna kill all the mice uh, by giving them helicobacter. So of course, in the very first experiment that Abby did, she saw that this was um, completely not true. So as you can see here, uh, in mice that have been colonized with helicobacter, we see a much, uh, or we see a significant reduction in the number of tumors that are seen, probably about, uh, it's, it's, it's modest, but it's significant. It's about half as many tumors. And I think this actually shows much more su substantially what the effect we see is. So early on, there's not really a huge effect on the number of tumors, but what happens is that these mice that have been colonized with helicobacter, they don't really develop more and larger tumors. So they essentially sort of hit a homeostatic um, point and they, they start to control these tumors, whereas the mice that haven't been colonized um, with helicobacter essentially continue to progress and get larger and more tumors over time. And this can be probably seen best by the fact that these uh, mice that have been colonized with helicobacter uh, after they've already developed tumors live about 100 days longer. So at this point, we really wanted to know a mechanism of what helicobacter might be doing. And since um, you know, as I'll show you later, it didn't really seem to be T regulatory cells. We, we next went to, to what so many people are doing now when they have an unknown. And we just did a single cell RNA seq of both the tumor and the lamina propria. So what I'm showing you here is, is analysis of the, of, the, of the lamina propria only that we did in, in collaboration with Dario Vignali and uh, Tony Sillo at, um, here at the University of Pittsburgh. And what immediately struck us was that the, the cell type that was most uh, increased in the epithelial space. And this, this will include all of the tumors found in these mice. So these are really a number of, a large number of these will be tumor resident cells was that the biggest population that was, that was shifted was the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And you can see that um, um, quantified here in a graph on the right. 
And, and so this, this was really gratifying and it was interesting to us to see that we were seeing this kind of huge increase in, in cytotoxic T lymphocytes. But I think where we really saw what the effect of helicobacter was really only became clear to us when we started uh, to look at these tumors uh, via fluorescent microscopy. So what I'm showing you here is, is a pretty typical tumor that develops in a mouse that's been given AOM and DSS. This has the classic sort of mushroom shape of a, of a, of a colorectal tumor. Uh, as you can see, this tumor is quite large compared to the, the surrounding epithelium. So one thing I, I would point out is that this tumor is not exactly cold, right? So this is not devoid of, of in particular T cells. And in fact, you can see T cells throughout uh, this tumor structure. Um, but we found very interesting, and we've, we've seen this be very uh, consistent, is that the T cells in, in mice that haven't been colonized with helicobacter tend to, be, tend to confine themselves to these sort of vessels along the tumor structure. Uh, however, what, what we see when we colonize the mouse with helicobacter is a very different story. Now we see CD4 T cells not only in these lymphatic sort of structures or, or blood vessel structures throughout the tumor, but now we see them actually clustered and concentrated around the center of the tumor. And I think you can also agree that, uh, that in, on top of the, the, the repositioning of CD4 T cells with, within this tumor towards the core, we also see a very significant increase in, uh, in CD19 expressing B cells and CD11C uh, expressing dendritic cells. So at this point, you know, we, were, we were sort of surprised to see the, this sort of effect on CD4 T cells. So, you know, we, we then next looked at what, well, are these CD4 T cells important? And, and what we found was, was pretty shocking to us. And so what, and which was that the, the CD4 T cells uh, are completely required for the helicobacter mediated protection against colorectal tumors. Uh, and that, you know, that was somewhat surprising. Other people have seen things like that, particularly in colorectal cancer. But what was more surprising to us was that the CD8 T cells were completely not necessary. So we could deplete CD8 T cells um, and we saw no uh, reduction in the ability of helicobacter to control the growth of colorectal tumors. Um, and and this, this was sort of, and we'll get into this a bit later, but there, there are some explanations for this. And, and one of them is that a deeper analysis of the single cell RNA-seq indicated that many of those uh, cytotoxic cells uh, that were in, that, that we discovered were actually NK cells, gamma delta T cells, and, and CD4 positive T cells. So there might be an effect of, of, of complementation here going on. But nonetheless, what this data really pushed us to do is why is asked the question of why are those CD4 T cells so important? And can we sort of figure out the phenotype of those cells uh, and determine what's going on? So at this point, you know, the choice to use helicobacter became very fortuitous because as I mentioned, we can go back and use uh, the T cell receptor transgenic uh, tools developed by the Littman lab. And now what we're going to do is use the exact same AOM DSS uh, model. But now we're, after we've gavaged with helicobacter, we're also going to, we're going to, we're going to adoptively transfer uh, flow, so flow or fax sorted naive CD45-1 positive CD4 T cells. And the CD45-1 molecule will allow us to pull these T cells after adoptive transfer out of, out of tissues like the lamina propria and determine uh, their phenotype. And what we noticed um, when we did this was we saw a really specific phenotype, and that was that the these T cells, and if you remember earlier, I said that these uh, helicobacter specific T cells tend to differentiate into two different states. Uh, the first state is regulatory T cells, which tend to dominate, and the second is molecular helper T cells. Here we saw really only one of those states where we saw that the majority of cells Helicobacter specific cells were becoming T follicular helper cells. And indeed, I think this had an effect on the total population of the lamina propria, where we saw about a two fold increase in the total number of follicular helper T cells. Uh, but this, this effect was really much stronger on the, on the helicobacter cells, specifically, whereas you can see up to 70% plus of those cells are really uh, becoming uh, follicular helper T cells. So one other thing we noticed um, while we were doing these studies, uh, and I, you may have noticed this on the image I showed you before, I'm going back to that image um, because it's one of the best ones we have, is that in addition to the uh, massive increase in B cells and, and, and CD4 T cells and dendritic cells that we see throughout the tumor uh, structure, we also see an increase in, it, we also saw an increase in, in these things, which are these very dense lymphoid structures, either within the tumor 
or very close to the tumor and much more predominantly in mice that had been given helical or colonized with helicobacter. And these, these were really you know, fascinating to us in part because we were already uh, working with and collaborating with a, a researcher at uh, University of Pittsburgh, Tulia Bruno, uh, and, and she and others had shown that you know, anti-tumor immunity from a variety of different um, therapies was, was, was very closely associated with the number and also the complexity or organization of, of these tertiary lymphoid structures forming near tumors. And so what I'm showing you here is actually uh, data from, from a paper from a few years ago in oncoimmunology, where this is actually, this is showing uh, recurrence of colorectal cancer post-surgery. And you can see that the patients here in, in the black line that have at least one uh, organized germinal center containing uh, tertiary lymphoid structure near their tumor at the time of surgery had a much better uh, uh, likelihood to, to survive without any kind of recurrence uh, after the surgery. So, you know, this data together with our T follicular helper data really want us to look further at, at these structures. And indeed, when we, when we looked at them more closely, we saw that this effect was maybe even stronger than we initially thought. So what I'm showing you here, this is indeed in mice that have been given uh, AOM and DSS, but not colonized with helicobacter, we do see uh, pretty significant lymphoid structures. But what was interesting about these structures is that they didn't really have the organization of the structures that in the mice that had been colonized with helicobacter. In, in helicobacter colonized mice, you can see that these structures are much larger. They have divine B cell and T cell zones, and they have dendritic cells sort of interdigitating throughout these, uh, throughout these structures in, in many cases. So indeed, when we went to count these structures, we saw that they really were much more commonly found in mice that had been given uh, helicobacter, and they seemed to actually even increase over time. So, um, you know, the, the presence of these TLSs was seeming to correlate with helicobacter and also seeming to correlate uh, uh, with um, uh, helicobacter-specific T-follicular helper cells. In addition, uh, these tertiary lymphoid structures, which are largely formed out of B cells, uh, if we deplete B cells, the, the, the mice receive no bene benefit from helicobacter um, colonization and invasion of the tumors is actually affected by B cell depletion. So perhaps getting rid of these, and I'll show you later more evidence for this, getting, you know, preventing the formation of these two helper cells or ablating them by getting rid of B cells uh, prevents the tumor from being invaded. So, you know, Using the tools that, that we got from the, from the Lippmann lab, we then were able to actually show that the, uh, these tertiary lymphoid structures, and here I'm showing you one from a helicobacter colonized mouse uh, that has actually gotten to be very, very well organized, that um, we can use confocal staining for the, for the congenic marker that's found on these uh, CD4 T cells. And we were actually able to show that uh, CD4 positive, CD45 positive helicobacter specific T cells actually largely um, um, localize either inside the B cell zone or surrounding it in the exact places you would expect T follicular helper cells uh, to traffic to. So just as a, as a summary, and I have a couple more slides to sort of really nail down what I think we're seeing here with helicobacter, is helicobacter hepaticus reduces tumor size it's making the tumors hotter. And all of this seems to be associated with the induction of, of bacteria specific follicular helper T cells. And as I'll show you, we think that this is related to that, the ability of those helper T cells and B cells to form tertiary lymphoid structures. So to do that experiment, what we did was we, I was very fortunate uh, that the laboratory next door, that of Amanda Paholic, uh, had, had many years ago made uh, CD4 Cree BCL6 floxed uh, animals. And these, so these are animals that have a very significant uh, deficit in their ability to form T follicular helper cells. So now what we're going to do in these mice is we're going to induce tumors with AOM DSS, and then we're going to give helicobacter, and then we're either going to give naive helicobacter specific T cells, or we're not going to give those cells to try and complement the defect uh, by the lack of T follicular helper cells. And so the, the first thing to, I'd like, I should point out is that these CD4 Cree BCL6 mice, very similar to mice that are depleted of CD4 T cells and similar to mice depleted of B cells, receive no benefit from helicobacter colonization in the sense that they, they know they, they don't increase the number of TLS they have and they have no dif difference in the number of tumors that are, that are forming. However, uh, transfer of naive helicobacter specific transgenic T cells is sufficient both to restore the TLS number 
and also to restore uh, the number of tumors in these mice. And you know, I'm not even going to show this image. I'll go right onto the next image. The, and we think the reason that this is happening is because these TLS are essentially forming a or serving as a platform to activate uh, immune responses that are then going to enter into the tumor. I would argue that this tumor shown here is much less populated with immune cells than this than this tumor here. And you can see that um, many of these immune cells are CD3 positive T cells that are, are, are making interferon gamma. And the, the, the other cells are, are very commonly, we very commonly see are these pink cells here, which are cells making NK1.1. And so finally trying to sort of complete that loop, uh, what we were trying to show was that uh, NK cells uh, were the cells that were sort of um, uh, complementing and the, the NK cells are probably the reason why CD T cells are not important. So here what we're doing is we're either depleting NK cells using an NK1.1 NK antibody or depleting both NK cells and CD8 T cells. And what we found is that NK cells are sort of modestly important for this. We do see a, a modest uptick in tumors in mice that have been gavaged with helicobacter and then depleted of NK cells. But we're, what we sort of expected to see was if we depleted both CD8s and NKs, now you would see a circumstance that was comparable to mice that didn't get helicobacter or mice that were depleted of B cells or CD4 T cells. But we sort of didn't see that. Um, and so our new hypothesis is that the, 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 the real mediators of tumor killing here are a mixture of NK cells and CD4 T cells. Although you know we don't have a huge amount of evidence for that. Uh, we're, that's, that's something we're working on right now. Okay, so just as one last data slide, uh, some of you who are watching might say, I really don't care about the microbiome and I really don't care about curing mice from tumors. And, and I get that, although I think you, know, you can do interesting things with mice. Um, but what Abby did to address that issue was she went into the TCGA data set um, and she basically took colorectal cancer patients and stratified them on, on different stages. And basically the patients, um, that have an RNA, RNA uh, transcriptome signature associated with TFHs are much less likely to be in the stage four, the dark maroon uh, wedge here. And they also have uh, 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 an increased um, five-year survival, or sorry, three-year survival time. And this is a, a similar thing was, was noticed in Gary Nolan's uh, recent cell paper where uh, patients uh, that had uh, stage four cancer that had T cells that were, uh, you know, phenotypically or potentially TFHs had a much better survival period than patients that didn't have these T cells in their tumors. So taken together, um, our current model for what's going on is we think that uh, Helicobacter is adhering to the epithelium or, or living in the mucus and being taken up by macrophages or dendritic cells and trafficked to those uh, isolated lymphoid follicles of the colon where they're leading to the activation of helicobacter-specific TFHs and, and, and mediating uh, B cell activation. And perhaps these together uh, induce different cytokines that will, will lead to the increase, increased complexity or organization of these tertiary lymphoid structures. And in, in data that really don't, I don't have, I didn't have time to show, we think that these are acti act, acting as platforms um, leading to better uh, tumor antigen presentation and, and better activation of cytotoxic uh, T cells, CD4 T cells and NK cells in the tumor structure. So then just as one final slide, if you take one thing away from, from this talk, and I apologize, I went very quickly, so I'm, you know, I'm happy to take questions, but if you take one thing away, the argument I'm trying to make is that if, if you're interested in using the microbiome to modulate the immune response, um, or you're looking for uh, a bacteria in the microbiome that might modulate the immune response, I would argue you need to really look hard at those mucus resident bacteria first. I think that these cells are good, these cells have been, or these bacteria have been proven to be much more immunogenic and that we might be able to narrow our search um, for the, the key components of the microbiome that you can use to augment immunity by really going after these, these bugs that spend their time in the mucus. So in closing, I'd like to again thank Amrita and Abby for doing a lot of uh, the amazing work. And also I'd like to point out Hannah Bumgarner who was accepted uh, to MD PhD today. So congratulations to Hannah uh, who took almost all of those beautiful images I showed you in the, in the colorectal cancer story. We got a lot of help on that story from uh, Amanda Paholic, Tulio Bruno and Dario Vignali. And also in the, in the first story, we, we got a lot of help from Yasmin Belkade, um, Betsy Norton um, and others um, in putting together that work. Thanks as well for the, the funding and I, I'm really happy to take any questions on either of the two stories.
Thanks, Tim. That was an excellent talk. I think we have a question in chat, one that I also wanted to kind of echo on the uh, NK11 positive cell characterization. So Sergey uh, is asking if those NK cells are ILC1s or some other sort of phenotype within group one ILCs. And he's asking if you would predict that um, this helicobacter infection would not protect interferon gamma receptor knockout cells in either epithelial or cancer cells. So have, you, have you looked a little bit closer at the composition of the NK11 positive cells in those tumors? So we have not. Um, we really need to do that. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in that image, um, and I am, I'm far from an expert in, in ILC1s and NK cells. Um, we were really, really surprised to see that finding. Um, but we didn't really notice a lot of those cells making interferon gamma, um, which to me would indicate that those are sort of more classical NK cells. But if you want to correct me, I'm happy to be happy to be corrected. But we certainly need to do more, um, you know, or better, I would say, or more thorough characterization of those cells. And we just don't have that done yet. That's a brand sort of brand new result. Um, and then in terms of using interferon gamma, you know, we do see in the tumor um, an increase in interferon gamma expressing cells in some of our experiments. But it, I should mention, you know, the NK cells have been extremely consistent. The gamma has been less so, and we really haven't been able to characterize that as much uh, like by flow or anything like that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if really gamma is really going to be the story here, although we haven't we haven't looked directly, and I know Abby has it, um, you know, on her to do list to block interferon gamma. But we haven't we haven't done it. We we can we can talk afterwards because we can help you with a lot of that stuff. Um, okay, Elise is asking if you look to see if the helicobacter antigens are being presented by MHC class two on your colon cancer cells, and do you think that the bacteria promoted anti tumor immunity is unique to cancer in the barrier tissue, or is this also like in the lung and the skin? Sure. Uh, yeah. So we have not looked enough at who's presenting antigens for Helicobacter, but what we have looked at, and so we sort of use the, the Helicobacter specific transgenic cells as almost like, a, you know, a biomarker of where those antigens are being presented. And really shockingly, Abby has not seen uh, Helicobacter specific T cells in the tumor. So that they, they really are confined as best as we can tell in the colon to those tertiary lymphoid structures. That's where Abby sees them. We, the first thing she did was look for them in the tumor because that was our idea. Helicobacter is gonna get into the tumor, you know, that you're gonna get presentation there. You're getting cross, excuse me, cross reactivity of, you know, cells expressing helicobacter antigens. We, we just haven't seen, we looked for that hypothesis. That was our first hypothesis. We have not seen that. Um, so, you know, and we also, the other thing I'll point out is we've been doing a lot of fish and we just don't really see helicobacter in, in the tumor. Um, we surprisingly, we actually think we see them, we see, can see helicobacter in the TLS, right? So there's like a macrophage or dendritic cell trafficking, some small amounts of, of helicobacter to those tertiary lymphoid structures, but we don't see it in the tumor. Then to ask the second, so the second question, you know, we don't have a lot of data on how helicobacter might affect responses um, outside the colon. We are looking at that. You know, um, you know, Abby was trained very, very well in the Vignali lab as a, as a graduate student on, on looking at tumor responses. So we are looking at that. There have been sort of some positive results in that area, but it's too preliminary, and I really have no idea sort of which direction it's going. But we are looking now at, at how helicobacter might affect you know, uh, the same tumors if they're, if they're you know, put, it, put on the flank underneath the skin, but we just, it's just too preliminary to talk about. Okay, I'm also getting some similar questions from Letitia and Amy, and they're, they're asking you, what do you think makes helicobacter infection unique and in conferring protection against carcinogenesis? So are there any other commensals that you think might drive the same type of response? Um, and, you know, is this unique with other gram-negative bacteria that could be added um, and, would you expect similar sort of phenotype with TFH formation um, for the commensals? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Uh, we have not done those kinds of experiments. Uh, what we're doing now is trying to find organisms that, that associate with TLS and TFH formation in humans. 
uh, with rectal tumors. We're doing that now with Tilia Bruno to try and go after those organisms. And, and the reason we're doing that is because no, we don't think that this will be unique to Helicobacter, right? The, 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 you know, the, the thing that we think that is critical to Helicobacter is its ability to activate um, the immune response by, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, irritating the epithelium, right? And getting those epithelial cells taken up by antigen presenting cells and trafficking Helicobacter to a lymphoid structure. So any, any bug that might do that same thing um, might be capable of this. So we have not done the experiments at all, but I, you know, I might, I could be completely wrong about this, but I might guess that you know, from the work of Greg Barton, that acromancia, which also induces pretty strong TFH responses, might be a good one to look at. Although, um, I should ask Greg. I have, we have not looked at it, but I wonder. I don't know if Greg has. And uh, another question from Joe is asking: In the EED positive E. coli, what's driving the R gamma T positive T. Rex? Is it antigenic peptide? Um, so, it's, you know, specific TCR specifically playing a role in Treg differentiation, or do you think that it's bystander response to gut inflammation? Yeah, so I, I mean, we, we've, now, we've now made the, the E. coli to do that. We just don't have the result. The problem when we do that, so we've made Tu and T.A.D. coli uh, that expresses the peptide, and that has been difficult to see the response that we sort of wanted to see with that. And we're sort of playing with that to try to make sure we can, we can actually see those kinds of responses. So we don't know about the antigen specific angle, maybe going after that, more with a TCR seek um, of those R gamma T expressing T regs would be a better way to do that. Uh, but now you need a way to get them without you know fixing them. Anyways, we're working we're working on that. What we have noticed, um, in which I just just didn't make the talk for lack of time, is that um, you know the signals that we know can induce uh, those R gamma T T regs, which are IL six, um, retinoic acid and bile acids, two of the three that we've looked at, we haven't looked at bile acids as much, but IL-6 is, is very, or not very significantly, is modestly increased in the ileum of mice with EED, but retinoic acid uh, production by the dendritic cells of the small intestine of mice with EED is very significantly increased. So we would argue, I would argue, you know, absence of evidence arguments are the worst, but like, you know, maybe they aren't actually specific to the E. coli and it's just, the, the milieu of the incoming Tregs that they see, you know, being dominated by IL-6 and retinoic acid is really pushing any proliferating Tregs that are that are arriving in the small intestine that take on that phenotype. But we need we need more evidence to prove that. So Tim, I'm gonna combine two more questions here because they're kind of similar and I will just um, we'll leave it at that because I know you're you're a very busy man. So um, Aurel is asking um, why do you think you see like control the tumor burden, but not, you know, complete clearance. And you think this is related to how these uh, TLS form and then how NK cell effector formation changes over time. Um, and then um, we have another question that's asking about, like, is this related to how the TFH cells are maintained outside of the tumors? And do you think that it's also, you know, related to how the kinetics of TFHs are modulating NK cell responses in this phenotype? Yeah, so the, again, uh, oh, well, I apologize. I mean, maybe this is maybe me getting burnt for trying to throw in new data at the end. So I know less about NK cells than I'm, almost, I'm certain I know less about NK cells than both of the people who asked those questions. So I don't know about the phenotypes of the NK cells well enough to say whether, how the TFHs are affecting the NK cell effector functions, because we, we just haven't looked, right? What the data we have on NK cells is we know that they're up by microscopy. We know they're up by, I think by flow cytometry. I think Abby's done that. And they're very substantially increased when we look at them on single cell RNAC. But in terms of phenotyping them, we, we haven't done it. Um, if only because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hard sometimes to take on a new cell type. Um, the TFH cells do seem to be pretty long lived. I mean, that, that's, that's part of what we've been working on. They seem to last the, the entire, uh, after the Helicobacter gavage, they seem to last pretty well. Helicobacter seems to be colonized pretty consistently as well. Um, and so maybe that's the experiment we should be doing to respond to these questions is if we could reversibly colonize the mice, you know, would we lose the TFHs? Would we lose the NK cells? Um, 
you know, how would that work? And maybe that, that should be the next set of experiments we should do, but we haven't done that. Yeah, one last thing to add. I, I wonder if the TFH production of IL-21 might be interesting to potentiate NK cell function, uh, which might be an interesting place to look. Um, yes, uh, we, also, we, we also remarked on the, on the correlation between IL-21 and NK cell function, and we hope the NIH agrees with, with that. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, thanks everyone <laughs> for joining us today. Thanks for our speaker, Tim Han. We appreciate your time and your fantastic talk. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, you know hearing about this work uh, in more detail and perhaps seeing it out in publication soon. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your attention. Appreciate it.